Well, good morning. It is good to see you all. For those of you that are in the room, for those of you that are joining us online, uh, welcome to Phoenix Bible Church. My name is Tim. Uh, If you are new with us, uh, I'm the pastor here and so glad that we could gather together to worship together, to sing together, to Look at God's word together in just a few moments to take communion together. Uh, If you're in the room, you got some elements when you walked in, some prepackaged elements. If you didn't, at some point before we end the sermon, you're going to want to head back there and gather those. If you are at home, we have instructions online of how to take communion, and you can gather elements and do that with us as well. And then we'll finish up today singing and declaring God's goodness once again uh, as we close out our time here. But hey, before we get to our series in the book of Ruth, Where You Go, I Will Go, just to double down on what Michael said, these are a a few important, significant, exciting weeks for us in the life of our church over these next few weeks. Uh, Next Sunday, as Michael mentioned, we introduce to you our associate pastor, A.C. Caswell. And uh, here's what I would invite you to. We're going to pray over his family. You're going to get to meet him. I would invite you to come in person and make sure you're here next Sunday. If you're watching online, mask up. And this is a great time to come back to church and, and, and let this guy know, one, that you exist. I've told him you exist, but he's not sure, and so I want him to meet a lot of you who are watching uh, from home. I want him to meet you and just really start this next season where we're bringing AC in to help equip uh, the Church of Jesus Christ even more, and so I love that 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 is happening next Sunday. The next Sunday after that is Palm Sunday. We'll close out this series in the Book of Ruth, and then the next weekend is Easter weekend. And it's really a weekend, not just a Sunday. It starts on Friday night with a special, reflective, a little bit darker Good Friday service at 7 p.m. right in this room. One of my favorite services that we do all year is Good Friday because it's kind of the time where we drop all the pretense and, and just sink a little bit deeper in the reality that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, was killed on a bloody cross. And we just give that a moment just just to mourn that and to grieve that and understand the weight and the implications of that. And so that's Good Friday. It's kind of like a funeral. And then Sunday is kind of like a wedding. And it's this huge celebration and that Jesus didn't stay on that bloody cross. He rose again. Amen. That's why Easter is such a big deal. It's not just a holiday where you get the Monday off. I don't even know if they do that anymore. Do they? It's bigger than that, right? It's an event that changed all of history. It's why we're singing in church today, because Jesus is alive. And so we celebrate that in multiple ways. Uh, One of the ways this year is we have kids ministry at both services. We've never done that before, 930 and 11. In fact, if you're a family, uh, we'd love for you to come to this service, the 11 o'clock service, to make space for new families on Easter Sunday at 930. In addition to that, we're going to have a donut and coffee truck here all day that's free for you. And really, donut. Donut truck truck doesn't really uh, encompass all of what this is. Uh, It's these little donuts that are kind of like funnel cakes that are different flavors, and they are fantastic. All right, and so we're going to have that here for you as well. We're going to take a a special Easter offering. Uh, We do this every year. We take not just, we don't take two offerings, like a general offering and a special offering. We just take one offering. That means no money comes into our church, our operations, anything like that. We give it all away every Easter. And this year, I'm so excited we get to give that to Ohana, uh, the foster care uh, initiative that we've been working with and program that we've been working with. Ryan Centers, who spoke here a few weeks ago at Christmas, we gave them gifts. And I don't know if you know this, in Arizona, there's a foster care crisis. There's too many kids, not enough homes. And so we have the opportunity to give to a specifically mentorship with foster kids in Arizona on Easter Sunday. And the best part is we already have a generous donor who has said he will match the total giving on that day. So come ready to give on Easter, okay? Uh, We have the opportunity to make a dent in the foster care crisis of Arizona. We have the opportunity not just to have a cute, nice internal service of Easter. We have the opportunity to unleash love moving throughout our city. That's the mantra of our church, love moves. We have the opportunity on Easter in such a special way to show that in a very vivid way. And then the last thing, there's a lot going on. I told you there was a lot going on. The last thing is baptisms that day. And that is, I've said this is my favorite thing about everything. That is actually my favorite thing. Now, we're going to baptize people at both services. We already have people registered. Some of you who have placed your faith in Jesus but not been baptized, you need to be baptized as well. Uh, We see Jesus model baptism. We see him command baptism, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And so we invite you. There's no better time than Easter where we celebrate that Jesus went from death to life 
for you to celebrate and publicly proclaim that you have gone from death to life. And people ask me sometimes, like, well, Tim, but I'm going to have my Sunday best on. I don't want to get in the water. What's the big deal? Do I really have to get in the water? Like, I believe I follow Jesus. Do I really have to get in the water? What's the big deal about the water? And what I would tell you is, you'll know it when you do it. That I've never brought somebody out of that water and everybody cheered and, and they proclaimed publicly to follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. I've never brought somebody out of that water and they said, that's it? I mean, that's kind of lame. That's never happened. There's been a lot of tears, there's been a lot of celebration because there's something special about publicly declaring that you have been saved from death. And so if you've been baptized as a baby, listen, that was special, but primarily for your parents. This is special for you. And so as your pastor, I would just challenge you, encourage you, don't wait. Don't wait till another time, another place. If you're wrestling with baptism, sign up. Let us talk you through that. We'd love to baptize you on Easter and celebrate that special day with you. So lots of exciting things coming up. Uh, Exciting things for today is we're continuing this series in Ruth. So grab a Bible and meet me in Ruth chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. Ruth 2, verses 14 through 23. If you have a physical Bible, that's the eighth book of your Bible. It's just right past Judges, and you'll see Ruth. Meet me in chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. And I know some of you are new, so I just want to give you a brief brief, uh, recap of what's going on, what got us to this point. As you look at the story of Ruth so far, what we've seen is this backdrop of unimaginable loss. Primarily through this lady, Naomi, we see this loss of food. There's a famine in the land of Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means house of bread, yet there is no bread. And so we see that loss of food with Naomi. We see the loss of family. Naomi loses her husband, Elimelech, but also her two sons. We see a loss of food. We see a loss of family. We also see over the top of all that a seemingly loss of favor. In that culture, remember we talked about this, a woman's value was primarily in the family she could build. And that's all been taken away from Naomi. And so her future has been taken away. Her security, her value has been taken. It seems like God has left her. And you see that in chapter one, as she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, which meant sweet or pleasant. She says, no, call me Mara. That means bitter because God has put his hand out against me. And so we see this unimaginable loss as we look at the story of Ruth, but we also see in the midst of that unimaginable loss, we see unwavering loyalty primarily through the person of Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law. We see her give this amazing speech, where you go, I will go. I, I, I don't care if you don't have anything to offer me. I am locking arms with you. Where you die, I'm gonna die. And not only am I going with you, I'm going with your God. And we see this exemplary, remarkable picture of the loyal and faithful love of God against all odds. And we see it through this person of Ruth. But we don't just see Ruth cling to Naomi. We also see Ruth extend out and be sent out to go look for some of that food and look for some of that favor that has been lost. And she starts to find it earlier in chapter two. Ruth starts to find food, but also favor in this person named Boaz, this this farmer who's, who's wealthy, has plenty, and he chooses to lend a hand and give help in the midst of loss. And that's where we are in the story. We pick it up in Ruth 2, verses 14 through 23. Let's read that together. It says this, And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, that's Ruth, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law whom she had worked with and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. 
Naomi also said to her, This man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all the harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this story. Such a a story from a, a long time ago, completely different context, but so many transferable principles to our story. And so, God, I pray right now in this moment of all the the distractions that we may be brought into this room, God, that you would remove our mind from distractions. You would sharpen our mind. You would soften our heart, and you would open our ears to all that you want us to understand and apply from your word. Holy Spirit, make this more than just another sermon and another Sunday. We pray that you would change our lives from the inside out by your spirit, through your word. It's in the name of Jesus. And everybody said Amen. Amen. Okay. The sermon title for today is this. If you take notes, Simple Supernatural Kindness. Simple Supernatural Kindness. Uh, We live in a culture that's crying out for tolerance. If you spend any time online, if you spend any time talking to people in our culture, tolerance, especially in 2021, is a word that you're going to hear a lot. And, And I think it's one of those words that's used so commonly and we hear so much, we're not even sure what it actually means. So I looked up a definition that I wanted to share with you. Here's the definition for tolerance. It's this, the the willingness to accept behavior and beliefs that are different from your own, although you might not agree. And this is what our culture is crying out for, right? With with different people, with different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different sexual preferences, different beliefs and religions, we say, hey, we need more tolerance, right? That's what the world is proclaiming and crying out for. And the church sometimes is critical, criticized, rather, for not having enough tolerance. But when you actually look at the Bible, what God is calling us to is not tolerance, but kindness, and because, again, we, we don't really know the etymology of words. We don't really know definitions. We just throw words around. We hear words a lot. We kind of can tend to lump tolerance and kindness in together. Right? Sometimes we think of, of kindness as just being polite, right? Just be kind to one another. And what we mean by that is, hey, smile at one another. Say hi to one another. Hey, don't cuss people out online. Be kind, right? Sometimes we think be, be passive, Hey, just, I know other people have different things going on in their lives. Just don't say anything. Just don't ruffle the feathers. Be kind. And we kind of think be kind. Kindness is similar to to tolerance. But as we look at the Bible, we're going to see kindness is much, much more than tolerance. It's much better than tolerance. As much as our world thinks we need tolerance, our world needs kindness. Right? We see an evident picture of that in this passage. So so we're going to break down what is simple, supernatural kindness really look like biblically? Here's the first thing it looks like. Simple supernatural kindness gives. And we see it in the text. It starts with this meal that what you have is these workers, including Ruth, they're taking a lunch break and they're sharing a meal together. They've been gathering barley in the fields. Now they share a meal together. And at first glance, it could just seem really simple. It's just a working lunch. Yeah, Boaz is there and Ruth is there, but, but what's so supernatural? What's so kind about what's taking place? Well, you have to picture this scene that Ruth, remember, is a Moabite woman. She's not an Israelite. What we said was the Moabites, they stem from Lot in our Old Testament. Lot, who had sex with his daughters, and his lineage became a lineage of incest. But not just incest, demonic worship. And not just demonic worship, but these were a people, the Moabites, who had oppressed the Israelites. So they were considered enemies. This is who Ruth is. So as they sit down for lunch in that culture, a Moabite who was an enemy of the Israelites, who was a poor widow, she would have been sitting over here. And the Israelite men who were doing all the work, they would have been sitting over here. That's what you need to be picturing. And, And this is... Simple, but it's supernatural kindness when you start to realize the implications of that. Because what you see, if you look at the text, verse 14, Boaz has to ask Ruth, hey, come over here. It says, so she sat. Do you see that? She wasn't already sitting with them. She was over here at a table by herself, and he invites her to dine with them. Simple, 
but it's supernatural kindness. Notice, he didn't just tolerate her. That's what tolerance is. The willingness to say, hey, you can sit over there, just don't ruffle any feathers, you Ruth, Moabite, poor widow woman. And he said, no, you come dine with us. Do you see, there's tolerance and then there's kindness. That's what we're seeing in this moment. And it doesn't stop there. Right? This kindness continues to give. We see in this text that, that Ruth is invited to sit down, but she's also passed grain from Boaz directly. Do you see that? He passed to her the roasted grain. Now remember Boaz, this is a man of plenty. This is a farmer, but he's a wealthy farmer. We saw earlier in chapter two, he has workers, right? He's rolling into work that day and he says, the Lord bless you. And they say, no, the Lord bless you. And he has all these workers and this great relationship with them. This is a man of plenty. It is likely that he had other people to serve Ruth Grain, yet he does it himself. Do You see the simple but supernatural kindness just in the sharing of a meal? We see it in more than the meal. We see it in the gathering in the fields. They finish up the meal. Ruth gets ready to go back to the field. But Boaz goes above and beyond again. He says, hey, don't, don't any longer just gather in the edges of the field. You gather from the sheaves. You go into the inside of the field. He tells his men, actually, you drop sheaves, drop stalks of grain so she can pick up full stalks of grain. She has graduated from the scraps on the edges of the field to just like the Israelite worker, she's getting all the grain just like they are. She's gone from outcast to abundance. And I love that, that Boaz tells, her, tells the men rather twice, hey, and don't reproach her. Don't rebuke her. You let her do this and don't say anything. She can take what she wants. Why did he have to say that? Because what they were used to, these Israelite workers, was not kindness but tolerance. Last week, remember we said it was built into the law, Leviticus chapter 19, that you were supposed to leave scraps at the edges of your field for the needy, for the poor, for the widow. That was baseline tolerance. Yes, just let the poor people gather the edges of the field. Let them gather the scraps. And Boaz says, no, I'm raising the bar. This isn't tolerance. This is kindness. Ruth, you come in and you grab everything you want. And we know they're not used to that because he has to tell them, don't rebuke her. Don't rebuke her. This is kindness. It's simple, but it's supernatural. That's what we see, simple supernatural kindness It gives. It gives abundantly. It gives indiscriminately. It gives to a person like Ruth who was an enemy. It gives to a person like Ruth who was a widow, who had nothing to offer in that culture. And yet Boaz gives, and he gives, and he gives. This is what simple supernatural kindness looks like. It gives abundantly. It gives indiscriminately. This is what we are called into as well. As much as I love this great example of Boaz, it's bigger than that, right? You see, many times uh, in commentaries and, and people will teach it this way, and I'm not against that. I see it a little bit in the text. Is people at this point of the text, this love story between Boaz and Ruth, they'll say, hey, this is their first date. This isn't a working lunch. This is their first date. And I can kind of see that, right? And they'll start talking about like Boaz is eyeing her in the field. And I mean, it just goes a lot of places, right? And you should come back next week because it does go a lot of places. Ruth goes, she lays at his feet. Some things are going on there, right? Come back next Sunday, right? And pray for me as I teach that. It goes a lot of places, and I I get that. I get the human level relationship that's going on here. But we're meant to see beyond that. We're meant to see supernatural kindness. We're meant to see that Boaz is reflecting the kindness of God. He's reflecting the kindness of God, that this kind of simple yet supernatural kindness, this describes not just Boaz, this describes Boaz as God. And it should not just describe Boaz as God, it should define his life, and it does, but it should also define our lives. If like Boaz, we've received his supernatural kindness, we should be extending it to other people. And the church of Jesus Christ, who knows an extravagantly, abundantly giving Kind God, the church of Jesus Christ should be defined that way as well. Amen? That's why I'm so excited. That's why I'm so hopeful. People ask me, I just spoke at a a high school retreat, four sessions with a bunch of high school students, and I just yelled at them the whole time. 
and was passionate and excited and just, and people asked me like, how are you, these are high school students who have been through a lot. A lot has been stripped away from them. My prom looked different. Graduation is looking different. College outlook and visits, sports. Some of them were canceled, online school. This has been a tough year for our teenagers. Right? And so they're asking me, Tim, how can you be so excited and hopeful? Don't you see the loss over this past year? I say, yeah, I, I've seen the pain. I've seen the sickness. I've seen the loss. I've seen the, the suicide rates are up. I've seen the anxiety is up. I've seen the depression is up, and I haven't just seen it in a study. I've seen it in other people that I know who are friends of mine. Now, I've seen all that. But you know what I've seen woven through that the entire time? is a simple yet supernatural kindness of God through God's people. That over this last year, did you know it's been a year? Exactly to this week, it's been a year since they told everybody at the NBA game, go home. Anybody remember that, sports fans? They sent everybody home. They canceled the season. We at church took out an iPhone at our downtown office and recorded a sermon in the book of James to go online to the whole church from an iPhone. It's been a year. Just let that unwind in your soul for a second. How can we, after a year of, it seems like unimaginable loss in our country and culture, how can we, how can I still be excited and hopeful, and passionate. Because in the midst of that loss, we've seen the unwavering loyalty of God through his people and primarily through their kindness, not their tolerance. I've gotten to see people throughout this last year. We've gotten to pay. You guys have done this through your generosity. We've gotten to pay for people's tuition. We've gotten to pay for people's bills. We've gotten to pay for their groceries. We got to pay for a replacement car. In the midst of all this year, all this loss, we have seen the simple yet supernatural kindness of our God. That's why I'm hopeful. That's why I have a positive outlook. Because I know what what God is about and what therefore the church is about. And we can get through any crisis because of the compassion of God's people. Amen? This is why we look forward as the church. This is what defines us. Simple supernatural kindness that gives even in the midst of loss. That's what this is about. It's way bigger than tolerance. It is kindness. The second thing we see is this simple supernatural kindness. It doesn't just give, it multiplies. We see that in verses 18 through 20, that that we see Boaz's kindness doesn't stop, it doesn't terminate on Ruth. We notice she gets an ephah of barley. An ephah in that day was 30 to 50 pounds of grain she goes home with. Now, Maybe we don't really understand that. You haven't done CrossFit and lifted a lot of weights. But this is kind of like a little CrossFit workout that Ruth does. She takes 30 to 50 pounds of grain, an ephah of grain. She takes it home to Naomi. And sometimes we read the Bible and we just kind of skip through details. That's a big deal. Like, I don't know if she had a wheelbarrow or I don't know if Ruth was just yoked up. Right? She dragging 30 to 50 pounds, people. She experienced some kindness, simple but supernatural kindness, and she doesn't just stay in the field and camp out there. No, she takes it back to Naomi, and we don't even know how she manages to do that, but I just picture old Ruth dragging 30 to 50 pounds of grain and plopping it down on the table with a big thud. She doesn't just embrace this kindness. She extends it to Naomi, Naomi, remember Naomi in chapter 1? Hey, don't call me Naomi. That's pleasant and sweet. Call me Mara. I'm bitter at the Lord. We see a different Naomi. Look at the effect it has on Naomi. She says she can't even get her words out. She asks questions multiple times. Where did you glean today? Where have you worked? That's the same question. She's stumbling over her words. She's so excited. She's so stunned. She realizes it's Boaz. Ruth says, hey, I've been working with Boaz. She says, Oh, my daughter may be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. This is one of our redeemers. We're going to keep talking about this theme of a kinsman redeemer. We introduced you to it last week, but a kinsman redeemer was a close relative, a kin, 
who would help redeem a family who had experienced loss like this. They would help buy land. They would help give us security and regain a security and a future for a family like this. This is who Boaz is, and Naomi knows this. Ruth doesn't have a clue yet. She just knows this is a really kind guy. But Naomi connects the dots and says, no, 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 you see, this is, this is kindness from our Redeemer. And I love it when it says, when she says, Naomi says, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Commentators will debate, like, who is he? May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Whose kindness is it? Is it Boaz or is it God's? And commentators will debate and the grammar and all this, like whose kindness is it? And I think that's the point. It's both. It's the kindness of God through Boaz, right? And that's what we see. This supernatural kindness, it multiplies, right? It starts with God, not Boaz, Boaz isn't just a great guy and a great example. It starts with a simple, supernatural kindness of God, and then it dominoes out to Boaz's life, and that dominoes is out, dominoes out to Ruth's life, and that dominoes out to Naomi's life, but it doesn't even stop there. It multiplies out to the world because Ruth has a baby boy named Obed who goes on, the lineage of that leads to David, and that goes on to bring about Jesus Christ, the hope and Savior of the world. Simple supernatural kindness. It doesn't terminate on itself. It multiplies. We see that evidently in this passage, in this story. So my question for you today, are you experiencing kindness, but are you also extending the same kindness to other people? Is the kindness of God, if you consider yourself a believer in God, is his kindness that he's demonstrated to you vertically, is that extending out horizontally in your life? Because that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to multiply. Right? We say it at our church, our mantra for the church is love moves. Glad all of you know that. Let's try that again. Love moves. It moves. It doesn't terminate on us. It never stands still. It moves out. That's why we're not calling you in here. I love that you come to church, but we're not calling you merely just to come in church and stand and halfway raise your hand about what God has done for you and kindness through Jesus. That's not where this ends. It doesn't terminate on just what God has done for us. It's about what God is doing in us and through us to others. And I believe in a culture that's crying out for tolerance, if the church of Jesus Christ would multiply out, not tolerance, but kindness, and that would permeate our world, I believe nobody would be crying out for the mere shallow substitute of tolerance. No, they would be amazed by the kindness of God. Amen? If that were to happen. Because simple supernatural kindness, it gives and it multiplies. The last thing, it protects. We see that in verses 21 through 23. You see Boaz tell Ruth, hey, you stay with my young men. You stay in this field. This isn't a one-time thing. This is going to be a consistent thing. You stay with this group of people. Ruth is telling Naomi about this. And Naomi says, yeah, that's right. You stay with the young women too. You stay with these people. This is your place of protection. And we see what the opposite could be, right? Naomi says, hey, otherwise, you go into another field, you could be assaulted. You stay with these people. This is your place. This is your protection. And again, first glance, this just seems simple, right? Okay, so Tim, so she gets to continue to gather in fields and work with these people. Like, what's the big deal about that? You got to remember, who is Ruth? She's the Moabite, the enemy, the poor widow, no value, no future. She's sitting at the other table. She doesn't have a place. And what Boaz just did is he gave her a place. He gave her a community to be a part of. And in that, he gave her protection. In that moment, Ruth would have known, maybe for the first time in a long time, she was not alone. This week, I just mentioned it, I had the opportunity to preach at a high school retreat, 170 students, 20 plus faculty, almost 200 people up at Lost Canyon Camp up in Williams, Arizona. This school right across the street takes their whole high school up to that camp. And I got to preach four sessions. And you have high school students. So I had to put on my youth pastor hat, which is hard because I've never actually been a youth pastor. 
All right, but I started out the retreat. I thought about starting it out this way. I don't know if you guys would have participated or not, but I started out the retreat getting one section of people to say amen and one section of students to say preach. And the last section, my favorite response, was just to say, mm-hmm. Would you guys have done that? Would you? I don't think you would have. I don't get the sense right now that you would have. But it was a lot of fun. It was high school, so you just got to picture that. They're, they're doing all that. They're, they're playing human bowling uh, in, in the gym. It's a high school retreat. So I'm preaching four sessions to that, <laughs> right? And it's just kind of this like hard shell of people and distracted and all these sorts of things. And at one point I mentioned uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump and they just started erupting for the next three minutes and talking and laughing about who knows what, right? This is what I was dealing with, right? And yet at the end of that retreat, this one guy who was the instigator of all that, every time I would say something controversial, he would lean over to his huge crowd around him and he would muck it up with those guys for the next three minutes while I was still preaching. And that guy comes up to me at the end of the retreat and he says, broken, tears in his eyes. And he says, hey, Pastor Tim, um, man, I'm just realizing at this retreat over this last year, man, I just have this haunting feeling of loneliness. And it took me a second because I was like, aren't you the guy who's been heckling me? <laughs> and I didn't say that. And I just said, man, I'm so sorry. And he just said, yeah, I can't describe it. I just, I feel alone. <laughs> and you start to realize he was expressing what all of us expressed, what Ruth had to have expressed his there's a loneliness to life sometimes. And just to have, no, hey, you stay with these people. This is your place. And just as I told that guy, hey, you are not alone. You're at a Christian school. These teachers, they don't want just your success. They want your salvation. You are not alone. All these volunteers, there was volunteers scrambling eggs for 200 people. That is simple supernatural kindness, amen? Amen. They were cleaning up after high school students. And I told them that. I said, bro, you're not alone. We gathered everybody at the end of the retreat and we put all the students, we crammed them all together near the stage and we had all the volunteers and all the teachers extend a hand over them and pray a prayer over them. And we just declared in that moment, God loves you. You're not alone. That's what just happened for Ruth. This Moabite, this enemy woman, feels like she's alone. Now she has a place. Now she has protection. That's what simple supernatural kindness does. It gives, it multiplies, it protects. This is why we need more than tolerance. Amen? Tolerance doesn't do any of that. Tolerance willingly accepts people who are different than you, who you might disagree with. That's not going to heal our land. That's not going to reconcile ethnicities. That's not going to make disciples of all nations. But simple supernatural kindness, that's exactly what will. And that's exactly the mission that you and I are on. But just like Boaz, it didn't start with him. It doesn't start with us. It starts with God. So you don't hear a message today of like, just be more kind to people. It's what everybody says on Twitter, right? This isn't Twitter. This isn't just be more kind. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is, hey, you've experienced first the kindness of God through the cross of Christ, who when you were an enemy sitting at a different table without any value, he didn't just say, hey, stay over there. You're good. You can go to heaven one day, but just stay over there and don't mess this thing up. That's not what God did at the cross. No, in simple yet supernatural kindness, he says, come dine with me. And he serves you personally through his son, Jesus. And he gives to you. He protects you. He says, you're not alone. You're with me. You're with God's people. I love you. See, first we have to understand and embrace that kindness. That's where it starts. It starts with God, not you. We embrace that kindness and then it starts to extend in our lives. And so we're going to end today taking communion. So if you've placed your faith in Jesus, 
you have experienced that kindness. And communion is a time where you embrace it, where you take the juice and you take the bread and you're reminded of the the radical, supernatural kindness of our God on your behalf. You're reminded Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was killed on a bloody cross for me. He gave abundantly, indiscriminately, when I didn't deserve it. And as you take that, here's what I want you to do. We're going to sing a song. As you take that, I want you to pray and consider, have I embraced this kindness, but also how can I extend this kindness? That's the moment before us. So let's respond. Let's let's not settle for tolerance. Let's embrace, let's extend the supernatural kindness from our God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for these men and women who are here. God, I pray that they would know they're not alone. God, that you have given abundantly your kindness to them through Jesus. And God, you've given to them generously other people to walk alongside them. And we don't deserve it. And I pray that that would hit them a little bit deeper than it has last Sunday or the Sundays before. God, I pray as we open this communion, as we take the bread and we take the juice, that we would be reminded of the kindest act in all of human history. That you, Jesus, came to us. You invite us to sit at your table. You gave of yourself. You gave your very life. You rose again. And you reconciled us to you, but also to one another. And man, there is nothing like that kindness. God, I pray that we would receive it and extend it in the name of Jesus and for his fame. Amen.